okay. I think we've only got a little bit left, so time should be okay. So looking at homeostasis, basically we've spoken a little bit. This is really important, obviously with a lot of different systems, but particularly endocrine. Um, we're thinking of stimulus response model. So basically we get a stimulus, um, a receptor detects that essentially. Um, we act upon that and then we initiate this response. So we can see here a stimulus again, pop these in your glossary, know these words. Um, so we're thinking a change in the environment. So something that will trigger something else, basically trigger a change. Um, a receptor, so a receptor detects this stimuli and then it converts this into, it says these electrical nerve impulses. If you're aware of what neurons are, we don't talk about them much today. Um, but these neurons, they're basically, as you can see here, the central nervous system. So that's our brain and our spinal cord. So these neurons will detect things. So say, yeah, say temperature is too high. So there might be something um, in the skin. So this is kind of the, when we're thinking of um, particularly this response, but you will get something that detects that. So the hypothalamus will detect that, but there will be other things that kind of send it to the hypothalamus first. So perhaps it's your skin, um, maybe detecting that the temperature is too hot or something like that. Um, so then that receptor will send that signal to the brain. So therefore the hypothalamus, um, the hypothalamus realizes, okay, it's too hot. What am I going to do? It has to initiate a response and that response is to cool the body down, right? Um, so we're going to act on the skin, the blood vessels, the cortex as well. So in terms of the brain, we're moving us, the body to a shady spot. So the sun isn't shining down on us. So we're a little bit cooler. At the same time, our blood vessels will dilate. So we'll get kind of our red face as we try to lose some of that heat um, and the skin as well. We'll begin to sweat as we want, um, like when our sweat evaporates, like that liquid that cools us down as well. So again, stimulus, our receptor that detects that, we're initiating this response through our effectors. So they produce a response to the stimulus. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. Again, I know it seems like a lot of words, but just think about the process logically. The temperature is too high. You want to cool yourself down. These are the three things that happen to initiate that. Okay, this is um, an interesting one. Take it as you will, but again, it's just this idea of pushing stimulus, receptor, response. Um, it's important to think about neurons. I know we don't talk about neurons too much, but understand that they are really important in transmitting this message. So they're very important in detecting what's going on, um, sending that to the brain and sending kind of receiving that message from the brain and sending it to the effector, which might be, um, you know, the blood vessels, or maybe it's the hand, stuff like that. Um, okay. So you can see, for example, we've got chemoreceptors. So you see, it's not just like, um, general things, you know, in the skin, it may be dissect, sorry, receiving the sense of pain, receiving temperature, even pressure as well. Um, chemoreceptors, maybe it's sound, you know, think of all your senses, right? Maybe it's vision, um, all that stuff. The neurons there will send that message to the brain. The brain will decide how to act on it. Um, so you can see here, the brain sends a message. Afrin and Efren, don't worry about it too much. It just means like sending something to the brain versus from the brain. Um, and then the response. So that's how it works. Just think of stimulus, receptor, message being kind of translated, and then response. Um, okay. Oh, I think my thing is frozen. Okay. Bear with me. Um, okay. Okay. There it is. Hopefully that's okay. Um, this is just showing you kind of what it looks like in terms of hormones in the endocrine. So we were talking about your um, secretory cells and stuff like that. So we have the blood in the capillaries and I can't emphasize this enough. Remember that endocrine stuff travels in the bloodstream. So we're traveling from a gland that may be somewhere else. So it may be in the brain and then it may have effects on, you know, a muscle somewhere else, or we might be sending something from the adrenal gland. So those sit on your kidneys and we might be sending it to um, let's say the brain or to the eyes or to the heart, something like that as well. So they travel through the bloodstream. That's very important to be aware of. Okay. Ways of controlling homeostasis. So these are the specific ones that are listed on the study design. Um, so thermoregulation, we're thinking of temperature, 
osmoregulation, we're thinking of water, blood glucose, blood glucose. Um, so thermoregulation, we're thinking of temperature, as we mentioned, and those are it's kind of the example we looked at before. So when it gets too hot, we're thinking of sweating, we're thinking of vasodilation. When it gets too cold, we're thinking of shivering, we're thinking of vasoconstriction, stuff like that. And you see how it's just this idea of balancing. Um, so obviously there's more to it and you'll learn about the ins and outs of it a little bit more um, kind of in your course and in the year. But it's just this idea of keeping it balanced. So keeping um, homeostasis is basically this, just this idea, if you break it down, like maintaining the body's kind of right levels at all times. So there's a narrow range within which the body can operate and function at its best. And homeostasis is all about making sure that we don't venture out of these limits. So making sure that our body doesn't get too hot, making sure that our body doesn't get too cold by controlling when we vasodilate, when we vasoconstrict, when we sweat and when we shiver, stuff like that. It's all about keeping it within these narrow limits. Um, same thing applies with osmoregulation, not being too dehydrated, not being overhydrated perhaps. Um, so it's this idea of the hormone involved is ADH, so antidiuretic hormone. Um, again, it's a little bit technical. Diuretic, think of like diuretics, they make you like um, pee essentially. So um, it's kind of what we talked about with the excretory system. It makes a lot more sense. Once you study the excretory system in depth, and then you have a look at osmoregulation, it ties it together so nicely. Um, but with, oh, sorry, with osmoregulation, we're thinking about um, if you are dehydrated, we're basically going to, like I mentioned with the lip of Henley and everything that goes on in the nephron, we're going to absorb as much water as we can. Um, and we're going to release this antidiuretic hormone. So antidiuretic, we don't want to pee. That sort of makes sense. Um, so you're going to excrete less water. Um, versus on the other hand, you know, if your water level is kind of fine, then you won't have as much levels of antidiuretic hormone. You'll be able to pee as the body wants you to. Um, and you're not absorbing or reabsorbing too much water because the body's got enough. Lastly, when we look at blood glucose, we're thinking about insulin here. Um, so when we eat a meal, we've got a lot of glucose floating around in our bloodstream is when we release insulin. So insulin is the hormone. Um, you'll go into the, into this in more depth. So again, don't be concerned if you're not grasping all the hormones and stuff like that. I'm just speaking about it generally. Um, but yeah, think you've eaten a meal. You've got a lot of sugar floating around in your body now. So we release insulin and that brings the glucose into the cells. So your blood glucose in your bloodstream is high. The body detects that and goes, okay, time to release this insulin. Um, let's bring these cells in. Oh, sorry. Bring these glucose into the cells. On the other hand, if your blood glucose is low, the body detects that as well. And then you'll start to break down your stores of glucose. You'll start to release more glucose into the blood so that the body has got more energy basically because you need enough glucose for ATP. It's really important. Um, so that's why, again, with all three of these things, keeping the body within these narrow limits. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. I think this is one of the last things we cover. Um, so we're looking at when homeostatic stuff basically goes wrong. So thyroxine, we're thinking of the thyroid. So the thyroid is just a little organ that sits kind of um, with your neck. So thyroxine is a hormone. And when there's overproduction of that, so basically when homeostasis goes a little bit wrong and we don't keep this under control, um, we can basically get this, um, yeah, this overproduction of thyroxine and that can lead to hyperthyroidism essentially. And it can lead to what we see here is like this goiter. So it's like this really large mass on the neck that's caused by this enlarged thyroid. Um, these two here represent insulin. So again, these are specific things that are specified on study design. So we're thinking of type one diabetes. So this is when you have a lack of insulin. Basically the body destroys the cells that produce insulin. So as you can see here, we've got our little sugar molecules and this represents our insulin. So in a normal condition, we have our insulin and this allows the glucose to come into the cell. Um, with type 1 diabetes, we don't have that insulin production. Therefore, glucose is just kind of kept in the bloodstream and there's always a, quite a high level of glucose. And obviously not getting glucose into the cells, that's a bad thing because we can't then have our cellular respiration and produce our ATP. Something else that's specified under the study design is hypoglycemia. 
So we can see on the left here, basically, we've got low blood sugar. That's what it means, like hypo, low, glycemia, so um, sugar in the blood. So here we have enough sugar in the blood, basically, and assuming that goes into all of our cells. With hypoglycemia, um, we've basically not got enough, and that can sometimes happen, especially with diabetes medication. So with this, we can see that there's a high level of blood glucose in the blood. So sometimes we'll prescribe medication, obviously, to those um, people with diabetes, and that can cause actually the opposite effect because the medicine almost works too well. Um, and so that can cause hypoglycemia, which is what we can kind of see here. And that can lead to like dizziness and things that happen when you have too low of a blood sugar level. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. I think that is.